Welcome. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm a halftime alumni from Greenville, South Carolina. This is our 42nd live streaming event, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you're taking a few minutes of time this morning to join us and just be energized and hear some great things because Halftime is the world's leading peer learning center for successful people who are in transition. We teach, coach, and connect leaders who are looking for more meaning, joy, and impact in their next season. Now, on that same vein, we have some virtual round table opportunities coming up. And so uh, please click on the link there in the bottom center of the screen, and that will email Lloyd, and you can tell him what you're interested in. We also have an option for an event at Scott River Gorge. So if you're interested in that, after hearing Lloyd and Steve talk about uh, some of the things that are going on at JH Ranch, please click on there and tell them you're interested in learning more. Now, life has many transitions, and maybe one of the most important is our transitioning role in our family. You know, our kids are possibly no longer within our home, but we still want to grow a thriving family. But intuitively, we sense that we're moving from coach maybe to just a consultant. <laughs> so what should we stop doing? And maybe what should we start doing? Maybe what helpful models could guide our vision for our new role is empty nest parents. Well, today we're joined by halftime alumni Steve Seifert, and he's been guiding families through this journey at JH Ranch for over four years. And this was after his moving from Edward Jones to really follow his passion. He fell in love with JH Ranch and took his son and daughter there. They deepened their relationship not only with each other, but with God. And so have 40,000 other moms and dad. So now how does JH help teach kids and parents what to maybe what to avoid what they had to learn the hard way? Well, Steve's had experience at helping scores of families make this exact transition. So let's hear Steve's wisdom on parenting as empty nesters. Well, gentlemen, I hope we can get everything up here on screen, and it looks like we have. So Steve has his B.S. in finance from Milken University and the Kellogg Management Institute. He was general principal at Edward Jones, married 32 years with two adult children, and he's now the director of the J.H. Ranch Everlasting Adventures. We also have Lloyd Reeb, a successful real estate developer, author of three books, and the founding partner of Halftime. Now, Lloyd, it was great gathering with you and Linda in your home with the other Halftime leadership earlier this month. And I remember hearing you say many times as we talked about this program that empty nest parenting is consistently a reoccurring topic with alumni. And I'd love to hear you share a little bit more on how those conversations go. Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for thanks for leading us and for your friendship. And yeah, it was a joy. We had what, 20, 20 some people at our home, all halftime alumni that live in our community. And, um, you know, halftime's a journey. It's a journey among friends. We need each other and we're inspired by each other. And so that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And, and they're probably, if you're an alumni in, in a market, there's probably dozens of other halftime alumni right near you. Steve and I built a friendship 10 years ago when we got to know each other and in his journey at halftime and i had the privilege of, of of being a guide along the way with him and learning from him at the same time and today he and uh his wife and linda and i we co-facilitate two weeks in the fall at a beautiful scott river lodge that steve runs as part of the jh ranch but doug you know the conversation goes something like this you, you know I've, as you know i've spent twenty thousand hours now coaching executives on midlife renewal and the conversation starts out well you know i'm um, finishing a long career at pwc or i'm about to retire in three years from or i'm going to sell my business or i've been a dentist for 27 years and i'm getting tired of it um, and uh, i'm thinking about what's next 
And the, this conversation starts with, what am I going to do? And as we start to build clarity and we do some careful thinking about the foundation of their life and what do they really want long term, then it starts to merge. Well, I guess I really should think through my financial plan because there are pieces of it that I don't think really undergird our calling or um, maybe my health needs some focus. But invariably, the topic turns to family. And, and they'll say, you know, I'm discovering that there's some missing links in, in my parenting role now. And I used to think that, you know, when the youngest one graduated from college, then they were off the payroll. And somehow inadvertently, I got thinking that my leadership role was done or that I wasn't quite sure what my leadership role was in the family. And now I'm discovering that there's these new opportunities. I have a daughter-in-law and I want to love her extravagantly but I don't quite know where to begin, or I want to have deeper conversations. We've never really had a family vision or values, or um, how do I get out of being the CEO of the family? And how can I help them hear my heart? And it, it, it just, it just bubbles out of them like that. In fact, that's a conversation you and I had, Doug, when you were in this journey, right? Because you had a challenge with one of your children and um, you were trying to navigate how to love them both equally and yet differently. And, and Steve, I think you and I had this conversation when you were going sure through halftime. So to set this up, take us back, Steve, to your journey and how you fell in love with this you, don't you wish everybody could go to J Ranch? Is Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Everybody should. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, in, in a word, the experience was transformative. And, uh, you know, we were introduced by some friends who uh, were introduced by their pastors. And so I did first take our son and really not knowing exactly what to expect. I, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for he and I to connect and have some fun. And little did I know the impact that it would have on our family even now, uh, 10 plus years later. So, you know, I was, I was blessed to spend almost 30 years at Edward Jones. We were uh, in NR, just a phenomenal company, great group of people, client focused. Um, from a worldly perspective, life was really, really good. Uh, there were always challenges. All families face challenges of various sorts. But um, for whatever reason, for me, uh, we were certainly dealing with some challenges with our son. Uh, it, a lot of energy, uh, even at that time. Uh, he was he was between his eighth grade and freshman year when I took him uh, to the ranch. Um, but but for me, there was an unsettledness. So even though from a worldly perspective, uh, life looked great, uh, uh, would would say near perfect, uh, there was my word an unsettledness to life for me. Uh, and uh, in many ways was caught up in uh, the pursuit of more uh, very performance driven. Um, and that, I won't say at all changed um, after, after attending JH, but certainly it helped, that experience helped to realign our priorities and refocus. Uh, certainly for me, it took me from religion to a relationship with Christ. That was the number one thing that, that uh, I certainly wasn't expecting when I went to the ranch. I I expected some uh, improvement between my horizontal relationship with my son, with our daughter, with my wife, but I didn't expect that vertical relationship to be strengthened. And I certainly came away with that. Um, and it, again, just, it helped to provide a foundation for us as a family from which we then ultimately built our family upon. Um, and it helped me to recognize my role as a parent given the stage of life that we were in with our kids. So at JH Ranch, we talk about moving from a caretaker to a cop, to a coach, to a consultant. And I was probably doing a lot of copying at the time. Uh, thankfully, we've moved past that stage. Uh, and uh, really that's one of the things I think we wanna talk about here today is, is as you transition to being a consultant, uh, there's tremendous joy in that. Uh, but there's also challenges even with that if we don't approach it the right way. Yeah, so when you chose to go to JH and be active, if you had been passive in that role, you might have missed out on Absolutely. the opportunity and the transformation and and um, and the impact it even had in Diana, watching you be rise to the occasion in that role as dad in the family. And the same way you and I could inadvertently 
miss out on the opportunity if we're passive when we're empty nesters. We could abdicate our leadership responsibility in the family. So frame up for us some of the challenges you hear from the hearts and minds of executives as they, you know, pack their uh, SUV up to leave uh, JH and, and they know their kids are gone off to college or, or beyond. And then what are some of the best practices that you and your team have been learning over these many years? Yeah. And, you know, some of this, hopefully many of you tuning in had the opportunity to hear our founder, Bruce Johnston, uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, he talked about some of these very same things. But I think oftentimes, uh, you know, one of the number one challenges can be when we have a, a child, son or daughter, whose uh, values and beliefs don't appear to align with ours, even though we feel like we raised them uh, in, in uh, a Christian home. Um, we, we feel like sometimes as parents, right, we did all the right things, but as they've grown up, as they've gone out on their own, sometimes their values and beliefs will shift and may not be reflective. The other thing is, even if they're, uh, and we're, we're blessed that our kids are following the Lord, both of them, uh, but sometimes their journey may not look exactly the way you thought their journey might look. Um, uh, that's that's not the case with us, thankfully, at this point. But I know for many, many parents, we hear that, but I, but I really envision my son or daughter doing this, or I really envision them marrying this kind of person. So we have to be careful that even though what I would consider to be the most important things, where are they at ideologically, um, where are they at in their relationship with Christ, those things should should be priority. We can sometimes even let the lesser things their career choice, their spouse choice be a stumbling block uh, if, if we're not careful in our relationship with them. And so I, I would say, um, you know, one of the greatest joys, and we've only been doing this for a short time, our, our youngest, uh, we've got two kids, a son that's uh, just about to be 26. He's launching a company. He's been married four years. Um, he's just in a great spot. He wasn't always in a great spot. He was the one that really challenged us uh, all through high school. Uh, he was a handful. And uh, we weren't so sure uh, how things were going to turn out. And, and we didn't have great alignment between us. Our daughter, uh, gosh, she, she really almost could do no wrong. Um, just, just a wonderful child. Uh, she she was her worst critic, so she was always always worried about how she was doing. And some of that, I think, she was feeling pressure, probably from me, if I'm being honest. And I think both our son and our daughter, I think, felt that even if it wasn't spoken, there was an unspoken pressure that they felt to perform, just based upon where where I was at. Uh, my wife, thankfully, is uh, is a rock. She is um, uh, she's she's one of those people who finds a way to be content in any and all seasons. Um, she's just steady and uh, mm -hmm. a prayer warrior. And uh, so all that to say, as, as we've moved into this phase, um, son married four years, daughter just married, graduating from college. You know, we're excited about this season because truly I think one of the greatest joys we have as a parent is parenting our adult children. Uh, we get to come alongside them and do life with them and be a part of their journey. And Lloyd, one of the things that you talked about, you and I talked about just yesterday was, you know, joining them on their journey and being careful not to, in, not to impose our journey or our expectations of, of their journey on them. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you want to touch on that, but to me, well, that's yeah, you know, that's something that, well, first of all, you and I aren't experts, right? Doug Doug and Steve and I are, are not uh, experts at this. We're fellow journeyers, but we really care about this because it's a big part of making a great second half. So I, I went to see my mentor in this space, Bill Wellens, who was a founding pastor at Fellowship Bible Church and part of men's fraternity creation and raising a modern day night. And he's a great, great guy and a grandfather of nine. And I went and spent you know a weekend just listening. And he said to me, Lloyd, when you show up in the room, whether you say a word or not, you put your family under pressure because they know what you think. They've sat through these halftime talks. They've read your books. They, You tell stories about the lives of people that you admire and what they do, the great things. Imagine how much pressure that is. I mean, that's just relentless. And you don't even have to say a word. Absolutely. He said, so you got to go out of your way 
to try to let them be themselves. And he said, at the end of the day, please, please, please join their journey. Don't judge their journey. And so I came home and I thought, well, I don't quite know how to do that. And so what I did, Steve, was I talked to each of our kids separately. And I said to them, I want to make a commitment to you to join your journey, not judge your journey as we go forward. And so if you ever sense I'm judging your journey, could you please, please speak up? And, and I sat in the front of our boat one day and the kids were swimming off the back with, with my daughter-in-law. And I said, Chana, what does it look like to join your journey, not judge your journey? You know, it's not passive. Joining someone's journey doesn't mean you don't ever say anything. You're not, you're you're oblivious. I mean, that's just abdicating. Um, But what would it look like to join her journey and not judge her journey? And she had great insights. And one of the great things that you and I are both learning, Steve, is that we can learn from our adult kids in this season. They can Absolutely. guide us and teach us. And one of the best ways to get started is to ask them for advice like that. So, Shanna, how could I really join your journey, not judge your journey? Yeah, I, Lloyd, I just love that. And, um, you know, p- picking up on that, um, I, I will say one of the things that I think is extremely important at, at all phases, whether you're in the cop, coach, or, or consultant phase, is ensuring that your expectations, you and your spouse are on the same page. Um, My wife and I oftentimes weren't exactly on the same page with regards to uh, things like gifting to our kids. And, you know, my wife had a tendency to want to be a lot more generous at times with our kids than than what I would be. Um, And uh, so gaining that clarity, being in agreement, extremely important. And then I think regardless, just a few other things I would mention, regardless of where your kids are at, the path they've chosen. And Bruce, uh, for those of you that had a chance to tune in, he talked about this uh, just a month or so ago. Regardless of where they're at, we've got to love them like Jesus does, right? We've got to love them like Jesus loves us. We've got to love them where they're at and meet them where they're at. So whether our values and ideological uh, beliefs align, whether whether their journey looks the way we envisioned it might look, we've got to meet them where we're at. And then importantly too, we've got to continue to model. So, um, you know, we, uh, just because they're no longer living in our home, uh, make no mistake about it. They, they know what life looks like for us. They see how I interact with their mom, with my wife, Diana. Uh, they, uh, they know that uh, when when we're spending time with the Lord each morning uh, in our abiding time, and they and they know and they have a sense when we're not. So I think it's our role to model. I think it's important for those of you that are that have been through halftime. It's important to share with them our roadmap. So how are we approaching our relationships with our family and friends? How are we uh, dealing with our finances? But with all of that, it's an invitation to them to be a part of it. It's not us pushing this on them. Um, I think it's important to be welcoming of their spouses. Uh, Again, our daughter just got married and, um, you know, we wanted uh, our future son-in-law, now our son-in-law, to feel immediately welcomed into the family and uh, uh, really to understand how we how we've navigated as a family and you know I think he has a sense for confident he does he has a sense for some of the challenges we faced but he has he has a sense for uh, the, the the joy and the uh, and, and the, the the strong relationship that we enjoy today but knows that it wasn't always easy getting there so he's been brought into the fold he knows the story he's been a part of, of that he's seen some of that journey along the way. And then just two last things I would mention, Lloyd, you, you know, you mentioned or alluded to, you know, we, we've got to be careful not to tell them or feel compelled to tell them all we know. You know, one of the greatest joys I had of late, uh, in addition to seeing our daughter get married and walking her down the aisle and um, watching them launch life together, uh, is our son, I alluded to the fact that he's starting a business. And, and he calls me one day, and we'd been talking about what he's doing. And, uh, but he calls me and he says, Dad, he said, I'd really like you to be a part of this. I know you're busy. Uh, I don't know how much time you have. But if there's anything you can do to help me in this venture, I, I, I would love to tap into your experience. And to me, that was kind of the ultimate 
for mm -hmm. me as a dad in this consultant phase. And admittedly, as he's moved uh, and, and began to build this company, I've had to resist the temptation at times to want to jump in. I, I've seen things, I'll hear him say things. And for me, it's been very, very important to take a step back and just make sure he knows that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, welcome to, uh, he's welcome to ask me anything, uh, but I'm very, very careful before imposing my thoughts and ideas on him. I'm asking for permission to do that. He's the expert in this space, not me. My 30 years of experience, I think I have something I can add, but I wanna be careful that I'm not thrusting that upon him. So I'm asking for the opportunity as opposed to assuming that he wants that he wants something from me. Um, so let me stop there and uh, again, would love any, any thoughts, Lloyd, you have on that. I, uh, uh, you've coached a lot of people in this stage of life, so. Well, no, there's so much wisdom in that, Steve. So permission-based and and it just takes on a life of its own, right? Because it's real. You know, they know that you genuinely love them. You want to love them extravagantly. You don't feel like you have all the answers and and you respect their opinion and perspective. And when my little brother was killed in a head-on car collision a few years ago, we had to do the funeral um, on Zoom. Oh. And... Uh, our family spread out around the world. And the morning of the funeral, I, I asked my son-in-law, Chris Pickens, if he would go through the script I had written to guide our family through that funeral and give me his improvements. And so he thankfully he did. And, and he he's a super smart guy with walks closely with the Lord. And he made eight changes to it, Steve. Wow. And I, I did, we did all eight of those changes and, yeah. and I looked over him at one point and, and, and during it and I, and I, we just made eye contact and it, I, I realized, you know, he, he's contributing so much to our family. Well, scroll forward a few years later, last uh, two weeks ago, we were down at Kiowa Island as a family and uh, we were, it was Friday night. We we're going to all leave on Saturday morning and we are sitting in the back patio overlooking the marsh and the sun is setting and we've had dinner, we're drinking a glass of wine. And, um, and Chris says to me, hey, dad, um, I got thinking, well, first of all, when your son-in-law says, hey, dad, isn't that bring joy to your heart? And, and um, so he said, I've been thinking, you know, you might benefit from learning to be more spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> so and so then there's some eye you know uh, glancing between all the kids and so i can tell i think they've had this conversation before and so then uh, then jenny the littlest one uh, she's not a little she's almost 30 but um she she uh, she says and dad you can't plan to be spontaneous and um and so we had like an hour-long conversation and i just said tell me everything tell me like how how could i do that like i i do have a propensity to plan so um well just so much joy in that and, and at the end I, they just said thanks for being you know, that, that we can just yeah. have this conversation right but where it started was not coming to chris with um with smart answers but saying to chris hey i i, I believe in your wisdom and um could you help me think through how to really uh, uh, lead my brother's funeral? Yeah. So, um, you know, these well, are things that you and oh, I have learned from other people. No, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. I, I just want to, I want to jump on that because the other thing I think, if you want to see your kids, uh, you know, I, I think regardless of whether they're high school or now you're empty nesters, but I think for us now, especially being empty nesters, adult children, they're both married. Um, I, I truly believe they light up when we seek their counsel. So uh, recognizing they are, they are experts. They've been raised very differently than what many of us were raised. And uh, they, they know a whole lot more about certain things than we know. And when you acknowledge that, like you did Lloyd, I think that's just so powerful. And I see their face light up. I hear it when we're talking on the phone, uh, when I say, hey, can you help me with this? Can I get your input on this? Because it's recognizing them for their expertise and their experience. And, and then the other thing I heard you say was just being vulnerable and creating an environment where people can be, your family can be transparent. So, you know, my, um, I, I can be a little anal at times and, 
you know, my family has a little bit of fun with that. And <laughs> it's, it's, you know, they, they know that it's okay to call me out on that. And yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've really got to be lifelong learners and and they're, they're going to be caring for us someday. So, um, you know, a couple of tactical right. things. One, one of the things that, uh, we have at the Halftime Institute is some systematic ways of having family conversations, like a, a sample design of a good family meeting, not about money necessarily, but could include money, but about, about the family values and vision and et cetera. And we can guide you with that. A, a toolbox. There, there are so many tools you can use in your family. And do you have a toolbox of all the different things you could use? Um, like an experience or an outside expert. My friends are an important tool in my toolbox as a box as a parent of, of adult children that are 35 to 27 or eight. And um, so if you want, just click on that contact Lloyd and we'll send you those tools. But I, what I do is I sit down every December and I go through the whole list of everybody in my family and I ask what's their biggest risk, what's their biggest opportunity and what could I do to help? And then I go to the tools and I look down through the tools that like, well, maybe what kind of a, a mentor would be useful to, to someone in with this situation? And, you know, we have a big uh, Rolodex, don't we, Steve, at this point? And, Absolutely. Um, and we can one of the best things we can sometimes do is point them to a friend that's uh, that's an expert. Um, so you're um, so let's let's continue with that. Doug, if you don't mind to talk a bit about. Um, this journey and your life and what you, um, what you learned in, in not freaking out when your child chooses a different lifestyle. Yeah. Oh, it, it was, it was quite a bit an experience and I do recommend avoiding it if all, all possible, but the, the Lord, the Lord didn't take us there. Uh, he instead, uh, I, I think felt like there must be a learning opportunity for us. Uh, so our daughter at 17 uh, left the house and pretty much rebelled at everything that uh, we cherished. Um, she explored satanic worship and Buddhist worship and stolen cars and <laughs> was frankly pretty aggressive uh, to us and the family. But uh, I'll, it, we'll be eternally thankful to our mentor who really helped my wife and I and family getting, getting through it. And, and I think we all grew as a result. And after about a dozen years of learning and practicing uh, unconditional love, uh, I'm thankful to say she's now restored and home. Mm. And she has a six-year-old, our six-year-old granddaughter. And Lloyd, if you'll indulge me, I'll share a picture. Um, <laughs> we, sure. we just went yesterday uh, for her graduation uh, from kindergarten. And I know it's just kindergarten, but, but hey. All so right. That's, wow, that's so that's our granddaughter, and uh, that's her mom who, who took us uh, on a, quite a prodigal journey. But I will have to say, uh, she survived it. We survived it, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're better for it. I, I, I didn't have any gray hair before we started, so. <laughs> but anyway, and Doug, I remember watching you um, learn to really lean into God's promises, and and to understand that we're responsible to our children, our adult children, but we're not responsible for them. Mm. And then to get on to your life, like Steve said about modeling, that model a life that's attractive and compelling and, and not just sit there at home wringing your hands because they don't measure up to your lifestyle expectations. What, what did you guys learn at, at the heart level in that painful experience? Well, you had to learn what the most important priority is in your life and your families, and uh, it brought us to our knees, and we uh, maybe sought God a lot more than what we had been in the past, because we, you have no answers in that situation. There is no right answer. There's just the best answer at that moment, and I guess that was the biggest struggle for me. As an engineer, I'm pretty binary, and, and there are there's 
there's precisely the answer that you should do. And in a case of a prodigal, you don't. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing right. There's just the best one. And we, we sought God to, uh, to seek the right answers. Huh. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, it's such a joy. I know she's got a home now and uh, she's got her own home. And that's a wonderful story in its own. We'll cover that another day. But take us into the poll that you've created for us. I will. Uh, so quickly, because uh, we know it's the top of the hour, and we're going to move to the questions in just a moment. I see there's two there. And just know if you jump into the questions that we will answer your question, whether you're there live or not, and you'll actually get an email with the answer. So pop your questions in, even if you have to run. So the poll that we have there, and we'd love to see how the audience uh, thinks about this. What's your single greatest challenge? when trying to guide your adult children? First answer is knowing how to be a consultant to our children and not interfere. Relating to them in ways that foster a loving relationship. Dealing with adult children whose lifestyle really doesn't align up to what yours has been. Adjusting to our new roles as empty nest parents while growing in our marriage. And finding an empty nest parenting model to help guide me through this phase. For me, that was actually the most important one. But for our audience, we're very strongly, our audience is saying, knowing how to be a consultant to our audience, to our adult children and not interfere. Second to that, Steve, is dealing with adult children whose lifestyle doesn't align with yours. Those are tough. So, Steve, you think you could lead us into some perspective on those? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've certainly talked about that first one quite a lot. But uh, as it relates to being a consultant, uh, I, I think the big thing, and, and Lloyd, I love the way you approached it with each one of your kids. We've talked about it as a family in a family meeting, uh, is, is we've really talked about our role or what we feel like our role to be at this stage of life with them. Uh, we, we've, we've made it clear, I think, that we want to be a resource. Um, we want to help them. God's blessed us. We want to be able to help them. We don't want to be the, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we want to be joyful givers. So we don't want to always be the, um, you know, the, the, the scrambling and gosh, the, we, we, we need help. Can you help us? Can you bail us out? Right. We, um, that takes some of the joy out of it. Uh, but I think a big part of it is just having that conversation, setting expectations, and importantly, as I said up front, being aligned with your spouse. Uh, because if you and your spouse aren't aligned in, in what that relationship's going to look like and how you're going to grow with them together, uh, that can actually then create challenges between you and your spouse that you, you, know, you certainly want to avoid. Um, but I think it really is about uh, inviting them uh, to, to leverage you as a resource, making sure they know that you, again, you love them, you support them, uh, regardless of, again, their journey. And Doug, it sounds like you had to do that. You know, thankfully, again, our challenge came in high school and our, our son early, early after high school uh, went through this uh, significant experience. Uh, really, he would say he heard the audible voice of God uh, spoke to him and he, has, he was forever transformed in that. Um, it sounds like your, yours might've come a little later, but you know, you were down on your knees and you were praying. And so I think that's, you know, we, we have to continue to live our lives. Uh, I think we have to be careful not to put our lives on hold. This relates to one of those other questions about how do we continue to grow our marriage in this phase? Uh, we've got to continue to live our lives. And, uh, my wife and I talk about living a life of adventure and maintaining the, um, uh, you know, we, we try to keep our, our marriage alive and fresh and feeling new, even though we've been married 32 years. And uh, so those are just a few things that come to mind for me uh, when I think about that question. Um, I, I have a tendency to want to push. And I would just say, be careful not to push, because in pushing, what you might do is push them away. Mm -hmm. um, so don't push, be inviting. Um, love them where they're at, love them the way Jesus loves us. Lloyd, go ahead. So, yeah. So Steve, the, um, 
we'll we'll wrap up this first part of our uh, time together and then do some interactive Q&A with our friends. But um, each fall, you and I do a few weeks out at beautiful Scott River Lodge with um, with uh, 10 or 12 couples each week, just going deep over five or six days into this journey with your spouse about, you know, building a great second half together with your family, building a thriving family. Talk a bit about that. And then Doug, take us into the questions. Yeah, we're blessed to have, we've got two weeks scheduled, um, September 20th through 25th and the 27th of September through October 2nd. Scott River Lodge is a beautiful place. It's an undistracted environment. Your cell phones, I, I don't know if I should say this or not say this, it scares some people, but your cell phones really won't work there. Uh, we do have some Wi-Fi, uh, but it's just a great place to get away, to uh, reconnect with your spouse uh, and to really engage in some thoughtful conversation around your second half. And, you know, people ask me always, when is the best time? When's the right time to have that conversation? I, I would say in many ways, uh, we started a little late. You know, we attended a halftime program in 2012. It wasn't until 2017 that I engaged Lloyd as a coach, but we had really already begun a transition into halftime. And, you know, in retrospect, I, I would have preferred to start that journey much earlier. So uh, if these things, uh, these questions, if the things we're talking about, if the things you've heard on other uh, previous halftime uh, webinars, uh, if these things are piquing your interest, the time is now. And uh, we, we just spend, uh, typically the mornings will be a time of, of getting together and some teaching. And you'll hear from Lloyd and Linda, uh, my wife and I. And then uh, we, we try to provide a lot of time in the afternoons for rest and relaxation, some adventure. If you're into that sort of thing, there's all kinds of various activities that, uh, that you can do there. Uh, and then we spend some time, as you said, Lloyd, at, at night around the around the fire. And it's just a chance to connect and share stories and ideas and grow together. So would welcome you. Uh, and again, there'll be a link to some information, I believe, as a follow up to this. Cool. Well, thank you, Steve. So, Doug, what are some of our questions that we've got? And, and if you've got questions, slide them in there. Uh, not that Steve or I or Doug are experts, but we really have had a lot of conversations around this. All right. Our first question, Steve, comes from uh, Roloff. And I don't know if I pronounced that well or not, but if I did not, my apologies. What do you do when your daughter often comes to dad for help or for answers instead of her husband? Because my dad is my hero and he can do anything. Mm -hmm. well, well, I'm kind of envious. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, you know, my, my quick answer to that would be, um, and, and our daughter comes to us a lot. She comes to me, she comes to her mom. And we actually have had the conversation uh, about um, the importance of her, her going to him. And not that, again, we don't want to help. We're, we're here to help. Um, but, but she does need to turn to him and it's important for him, uh, as a, you know, as a leader of their family, um, it's, imp it's important for him and it's a way to honor him as her husband. Uh, so we, uh, I would just say we'll subtly push back sometimes, um, when, when a question comes our way, it's, have you talked to Matt about that? Right. Even even prior to them being married, because they've only been married a short time, just a few weeks. Um, have you talked to Matt about that? Have you and Matt talked through that? That's a you know, that's a great question. But I really think that's a that's a Matt question. And so I we certainly want them to know both of our kids to know, again, that we're welcome. Uh, we welcome their questions. We, we welcome the opportunity to help. But their spouses need to be that first outside of seeking God's wisdom, their spouses need to be their, their first connect. And what, and what other approach in addition is, is to come at uh, the families, you, you know, how we serve each other inside a family from a strengths-based perspective. And so the, the family, if you, if your family knows each other's strengths, 
then you can lean on each other's strengths. And uh, Carter's top strength is empathy and uh, adaptability and learner and input. And so he's a scientist, student, and he really understands how you're feeling. It's amazing to see his empathy. And I had an empathetic thought once, and then I remember it went away, <laughs> you, you know? And so, uh, but I, I have strategy and futurist, right? So they laugh at me when they all came in one day and we had a big flip chart. I was working with, with Jenny, our littlest girl, on what she was going to do after college. And there was like a big flip chart up on the wall and we had all this stuff on it. And they were like, oh my, you know, this little eye rolling goes on. But you know what? They come back and sit down and I can help them with that. But um, so, so the other side is, you know, to say, you know, well, to highlight the strengths of your son-in-law and daughter-in-law so that they, it counterbalances an area where they may not have had any experience and they actually may not be able to help well with finance because maybe they had no experience in finance. And, um, but the other side is maybe point them to an outside expert. So, you know, we've said to our, our kids, Hey, we'll pay for the financial freedom university. We'll help you get connected with the, you know, the Ron blue company so you can get Christian financial advisors um, I think Edward Jones even has one Christian financial advisor that I've met once. That was a joke, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a bunch. You got a lot. That's yeah. Right. So you know, that's like pointing them to somebody outside that can. So yeah. it's not just me or or you. Yeah, I, I I would just add too. I think that, um, and we talked about this already, but you seeking their counsel. So I've already begun to seek the counsel of our son-in-law. He's an engineer. I'm not an engineer. So um, Doug, you would love him. Uh, but he's got a mind and he, he's got strengths, as you're alluding to, Lloyd. He's got strengths that I don't have. He's certainly got strengths that, you know, my, my kids aren't blessed with. So in us going to him, and, and it, I think that also points our daughter to him. Uh, and helps her to recognize the the resource that he is. That it doesn't always have to be going to mom and dad. That you know she's really now uh, in in a stage where she needs to be going to him. Hmm. Well, what a great question! And they're starting to uh, pour in here. So we will switch to the to the next one. Um, Edwin asks, "How might you encourage your adult son?" to grow closer in his walk with the Lord, if you really feel he's not as strong in his faith maybe as he could be. Do you have any suggestions on perhaps one-on-one -on -one sessions or, you know, what, what finding things in, or approaches he might find agreeable? Yeah, you know, for us, we're, we are blessed that both of our kids are following the Lord, and so um, I don't know that I can answer that specifically as it relates to their relationship with Christ. Certainly at times as they were growing up, uh, they had questions and we had questions. I, I had questions. Um, so um, I, I found that by setting down with them and asking questions um, and resisting, again, the temptation to push our beliefs on them, was critically important, and I would say still is. Uh, Lloyd, you might have more experience with that one, um, but for me, that's it's it's it, it comes back to that idea of just resisting the temptation to push, and just asking thoughtful questions, um, and 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 again, loving them where they're at, going as far as they'll allow you to go, but not not pushing because you run the risk of pushing them away. Yeah. And, you know, each kid's unique. So their faith journey is different. And our middle daughter, Carolyn, who's a missionary in France with Campus Crusade, when she was eight or nine, I would take her, I've taken our kids on a date every month and I would take her on a, a date, just the two of us, to some fun restaurant that she loved. And I knew she was going to ask me a tough question. So I have a file sitting right over there. It says Carolyn's tough questions. <laughs> and that's when she was nine, 10, 11. And, you know, she would ask me, okay, but how do I know that when we get to heaven, God won't be mean? He could be mean, you know, or uh, how come God lets so much bad things happen? Like the little girl in my sixth grade that got cancer. And, um, 
so I had to deal with th those when she was young. And, and I remember writing stories to try to illustrate uh, apologetics in a child's language. And, and yet our son Carter went, you know, to youth group did, did just followed along with the Lord all the way through his PhD program. And then, um, and then came back and said, you know, I've got so much science that conflicts with my faith. I've got to figure out how to reconcile. He came into this same study here and sat down with me and said, dad, I, I gotta, I gotta sort this out. Now his thinking was, is so far beyond my comprehension in terms of science that I, I couldn't be a resource, but I have a dear friend who's an ear, ear, nose and throat doctor, and he is a scientific apologist. That's his calling. He came through halftime and I coached him. And that's what he wants to do. And it was so interesting because Tom came over here to spend time with Carter and, um, and, and Tom came from the OR and he had his scrubs on. And I said, it was eight, eight o'clock. And I said, Tom, have you had anything to eat? And he said, no. Um, and I said, well, look, here's the deal. I'm going to cook you the best meal I know how. And then you and Carter go in the back room and, and talk about faith. Well, I'm in there cooking and I hear him out there saying, Carter, that's a great question. Way to go. Good question. Then they laugh. And then another question. And then he walked out the door and I said, well, Carter, you guys just laughed. He said, yeah, the guy is, that's a great guy. And he didn't answer any one question. He just affirmed him for being on this journey. And then he asked permission if he could just send him something, an article from time to time that would deal with Quarks mm. and any quarks. I mean, I don't even know what quarks and any quarks are. <laughs> but when you're deep into science and faith and you're trying to see how it jives. So, you know, each kid's different, right? But the, I think the part yeah. about that is to just be engaged humbly, to be on our knees and to be open to, you know. So I asked Carter for permission to send him uh, a book from time to time. I sent him two books that fit his journey. One was The Language of God by Francis Collins, who runs National Institutes of Health. And it's a science book about DNA and why God wrote your name in 20,000, you know, you're in your DNA sequence. And then the, 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 um, Reason for God, which is a philosophical book by Tim Keller. Now, I went through 14 different books before I picked those two, and I asked Cart for permission. But at the end of the day, the part I love is the end of the day, Carter's faith journey. Um, he called his mom and said, hey, I've been um, reading like Habakkuk or something. He said, it just struck me. And I'm like, Habakkuk? There's nothing in there that could possibly uh, be scientific apologetics. And, and it was just a reminder to us that this, it, this is a work of the Spirit of God. And to me, that's so comforting. Yeah, and recognize, too, that it may take time. You know, I, I, I remember Bruce saying that uh, and really emphasizing the fact that it may not happen in the time frame that you'd like to see it happen. Uh, but again, you have to be careful not to push it. But it may take some time. And uh, I, I love the ideas, Lloyd, about you know, sharing resources, sharing the books, leveraging the relationships you have. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody else within your within your network, your friend group. My prodigal daughter asked to meet in a park, <laughs> but she wouldn't come home. Mm. And she, we were sitting across a picnic table, and she said, Dad, I've gone to a satanic worship, and I'm now, I'm, I'm scheduled to go to a Buddhist. Of course, your mind rages at that point. What, what do you say? What do you think? And I remember a, a thought came to my mind, and I said, well, honey, I guess you're really going to learn what is truth. Hmm. Mm. Wow. That's a great question, Doug. Well, I, I, I'd like to think I came up with it. I'm pretty sure I didn't. But <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very grounding because it wasn't confrontational. I think she hoped she could get a reaction out of me, which generally is pretty easy. <laughs> and uh, when I didn't react that way, I, I think it it uh, drew us to, more together than it might have had I reacted mm. normally. Mm. Well, we have another question here. Uh, Edwin, that was a great question. Uh, Roth has another good question. Have been... Issues between mom and daughter, where the mom may be actually interfering, and poor dad gets caught in the middle, and the wife then asks the dad to agree, don't you? 
Uh, yes, that, that, that happened a lot in the past. Uh, thankfully, it happens a bit less now. Uh, and I would just take you back to that uh, comment I made earlier about alignment and gaining clear expectation with your spouse, uh, working through your roadmap together. You know, one of the things we spend a lot of time on, right, Lloyd, at, at uh, Scott River Lodge is, uh, is, is just that. And so, um, you know, there, there will still be those instances, but I think that gaining clarity as, as husband and wife around your role as a consultant and how you both view that as it relates to really every facet of being a, a consultant uh, for our children, I think is just critically important. And there are still times where, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I know, for example, uh, you know, our son is starting this business and we've invested in his business. And I was joking with some friends yesterday that, you know, if it was up to my wife, she'd give our son his, our entire net worth. She'd, she'd, she'd be all in. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly not doing that, but that's just her nature. She's a, she's a giver. And uh, so talking about in advance, some things that uh, we, you know, we might not have otherwise, the temptation might've just been to, to jump in and provide a response. We've, we've had been very intentional about pressing pause and saying, no, 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 let's us get some agreement and then let's have the conversation with the kids. Yeah, and you know, what, one way to start with alignment, and we work on this at Scott River Lodge, is what is your vision for your family? What are you aiming for? Do you just want successful kids? Do you want upstanding members of society? Uh, that's not what we're aiming for as a family. We're looking for a family that is, is following God because we know it's in their long-term best interest and is loving and serving each other, is knows their calling and is living it out and they're effective at what they do. And um, so, it, you know, we're not trying to just build wealthy, successful kids in the financial perspective or career perspective. Um, and so that helps us then with those, with that long-term clarity, it helps Linda and I decide where to put our money, where to put our effort, what to applaud, um, what to just let go of. Um, and you know, our kids are going to have different levels of wealth. That's okay. And it's our job to just fit in. Um, but I think if you don't have clarity and alignment along what your vision is for your family, the Bible says where there is no vision, the, the people perish. And I think where there's no vision, the family just drifts Absolutely. with the culture. Yeah. You know, we're, we're getting ready. Uh, we, we do not have grandchildren yet. We're anticipating grandchildren at some point in the future and looking forward to that. But we're already talking about the the realities of that and even our role there and and we've begun to talk about it a, a bit with our kids our kids do not live near us so when we when we go to see them we're either living with them in their small homes uh, where they both live now or we're living in a hotel room or our rv and uh, so even even looking ahead to those significant life events and having conversation about our role, understanding what their expectations might be um, in, in hopes of really avoiding some potential conflict down the road. Yeah. Well, I think we have one last question. But Rolf is full of really good ones today. <laughs> and by the way, guys, a uh, lot of good accolades there and there where folks are really appreciating your, your answers. So we appreciate that. So this, this might be our last one. Uh, how would you recommend seeking to better understand our adult children's relationships, especially those that are possibly approaching marriage? Mm. Um, so our, our daughter actually was, um, was engaged once uh, to a young man, and I would say um, fine young man, but we, we didn't, I didn't, uh, approach that in the right way. And, uh, I really reflecting on, on that relationship. I think there was an opportunity to spend more time with her asking questions, understanding where her head and her heart were more time with him. And so fast forward, 
uh, as she began into the relationship with the young man that she ultimately married here a few weeks ago, um, I, you know, was able to learn from, from that experience. So, um, spent a lot of time with our daughter, uh, just asking questions about the relationship. What, what is it that she loves about him? What's, you know, tell us about it. Tell, what, what is, what's, you know, what's his, what's his biggest fear? What's his, his most, you know, his proudest moment. Talk about his relationship with his mom and dad. So I, I would say through asking questions, it, it, it really brought our daughter to a, a great place. Um, there were things that I think through our time together, uh, they were able to take into their uh, marriage counseling and uh, work through together as, as a couple. And I, I believe their relationship is uh, it's just in a great place as they launch this new life together now. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the way we approached it. It was, it was just more intentional time, asking a lot of questions. I've used this a lot, but not pushing, not pushing because it's the man she's going to marry, not the man we're marrying. He's going to become a part of our family, but ultimately it's a decision that she needs to make. And, you know, Steve, that idea of uh, counseling is also a, a way to help in, in their relational navigation. So one of the things we do is we uh, pay for each um, couple as they get married to have 12 uh, counseling sessions with the, a wonderful Christian counselor of their choice. We do a little of the homework because they're usually uh -huh. busy at that season of life. We do the research for them. Our daughter and son-in-law live in DC on Capitol Hill. So they need somebody that's right nearby. So we did the research. Um, we, with their permission, we pay for 12 uh, sessions up front and then they just use them. And we, we just tell them about our experience with counseling, how, you know, it helped us discover all the screw ups uh, that Linda had mm -hmm. and how great a person I was. Um, and that, that's a second joke, Steve. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, we tell those stories, which the kids laugh at. And then, um, w w you know, we just ask them, how's that going? And so Jenny said the last time she said, well, we've had four of them. And she said, dad, frankly, a lot of the conversations about you, <laughs> and, and I'm like, seriously, that can't possibly be, it, you know, and sure enough, I mean, we, we can do our best at parenting and still end up with things that we didn't were unintended consequences. And so I had, I had to say to Chris and, and Jenny, like, is, what do I need to apologize for? Like, help me, help me see, you know, and, and they're like, no, it's nothing. It's just that you're, you're a person with a big personality, a lot of energy and, and big goals. And you bought your first piece of land when you were 14. And, and that, that's weird. So, um, you know, <laughs> we, we have to deal with that. And so, yeah. um, well, I think there's so much, like you said, there's so much joy in this season. If we can kind of loosen our shoulders, commit to loving them extravagantly, put their interests ahead of our own, not push ourselves on them during the journey, not judge their journey. And then trust God that we're responsible to yeah. them, but not for them and get on with our own life. And we really live a winsome life that they just, they're just drawn to. Right. And, and um, that's, I think the big message you and I want to impart and that, that, that we invite people to uh, at Scott River Lodge. Yeah. And I, I, gosh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say too, part of that asking questions of your son or daughter about their potential spouse, their significant other, uh, you want to be able to love. We, we alluded to this earlier. I want to be able to love our son-in-law well. And one way for me to do that is to understand him. And, and so as that relationship was developing by asking those questions, by getting her to talk about him and what it is she's she's uh, she's taken by with him. It really put us in a place to better un interact with him as first a friend and then a, a boyfriend and and fiance and now a husband. Uh, so part of it is we want to love them well. This helps us to do that. Well, it is pretty close to the bottom of the hour. But Steve, for those that might have popped in late, maybe they just wanted to ask you a question. Could you kind of summarize in just one or two sentences how you would advise somebody parenting as an empty nester? Yeah. Uh, and Lloyd, you did a nice job of summarizing, I think, a moment ago. But I would say, again, be welcoming, 
uh, you're, you're there to be a resource, uh, avoid pushing, uh, resisting the temptation to tell them what they should do, how they should do it. They're adults now. Uh, you know, again, love them where they're at, love them in the way Jesus loves us. And uh, so th those would be, you know, ask questions, just ask questions, seek their counsel, recognize them for the wisdom that they possess, the experience that they bring to the table. Those would be a handful of things that I would remind people of. Wow. Steve, thank you so much. And thanks for your friendship. And and Linda Thank and I are you. really looking forward to the time with Diana and and I love it when we get them the, those two beautiful ladies with their cowboy hats on and we do the <laughs> you know the, the late night dancing um, that's that's an awesome adventure together yes. and that's actually well, my, part of the joy of our second half right yes absolutely my my wife is definitely my better half and the more fun half so um, she was clearing the dance floor at my daughter's at our daughter's wedding so. She was having more fun, I think, than most everybody there. Well, Steve, I thank you for your time. Lloyd, these are always thank so you. much fun to do together. And audience that has joined us, uh, the Yumbi, and I probably didn't do that one too well, and Siong, and uh, Monica. Boy, I mean, we've just, uh, Linda, uh, so many people there and so many nice thoughts, good Good food for thought on how to make our family thrive. Steve, this was just awesome. I just thank you for taking the time to do this, working it into your schedule, and I hope everybody can take advantage of this upcoming opportunity at JH Ranch. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.